The Steve Dangle Podcast with your hosts, Steve Dangle, Adam Wilde, and Jesse Blake. Let's go! God, it's becoming a tradition. A first round exit in the final game, followed by Chris Johnson telling us what the hell happened this year. So clearly beloved. <laughs> I mean, we really didn't expect you to. We are gathered here today. Yeah, yeah. We didn't expect God. to see you celebrate this thing called life this early. Thank you for the Prince reference there, Jesse. You're um, <laughs> uh, I, I uh, Chris, I mean, where do we start with this? How, first off, first off, and I think this is a, this is a good question from the, from the listening audience. Somebody was like, Chris, how are you? How are you? <laughs> I'm doing all right. You know, yeah? it's, it's busy, right? And like the best kind of busy, the playoffs. Uh, but you're literally working every day, all day. Uh, and then late into the night, of course. But I mean, I mean, it's the best. I mean, probably the way the fans feel. It's not that different being on the media side. I'm still excited for the games. The storylines pop. You know, you can tweet something innocuous and it gets like 3,000 retweets because this fan base is just locked right in on everything going on. Um, so, you know, it's a lot of fun. And then it ends and you kind of feel hungover even if you didn't drink. Like, you almost <laughs> just feel like you just feel like it's like you, you, it's a you, ooh, emotional letdown. Um but, you know, I, I certainly can't complain. I, I was surprised to see them lose from where they were, probably like everyone else. But, uh, you know, interesting offseason ahead, and it's actually been an interesting few days since the season ended. So, yeah, uh, yes, and we will get to that. <laughs> what, what I always love is the, the, the accounts. Like, I, I love the accounts from Boston 2013 and, you know, journalists talking about, oh, I was – I wasn't even in my seat for, for the game tying goal. I was in the tunnel because we, it was the third period and we went down. Obviously this year is a little different. What was this collapse like to you? Like, where does the story begin? Does it begin in game four where they're as high as they could possibly be? Does it begin losing game five? What's it like for you? Who? The, it almost the anatomy begins of blowing it. <laughs> it begins in game seven in a way like game five and six. Look, there's lots not to like about the way those games start, yeah. but they're showing all kinds of life. They're coming back in it. I think the shots were six, two in the third period in game five after they tied at three, three. So like they kept pushing uh, for the winner and had some chances late in regulation and a minute in Alex Galchenyuk turnover, right? Bang. It's in the net game six, crappy start. Jack Campbell plays awesome in the first period. So Montreal, good. Montreal ends up having that weird set of circumstances with the goal challenge, the Marner puck over the glass penalty. They get a two nothing lead. The Leafs fight back. They get the first ten shots of overtime, thirteen to two advantage overall. Really, one chance and in the net. So okay, that's I guess that's where it starts. Like that, that's where the collapse or whatever you want to call it starts. But like I thought they played pretty well in those two games. Not perfect, yes. You'd rather them start and get a lead and just suck the life out of it. But they had lots. I think by the time they got to game seven, though, everything was unraveling and they just didn't get anything going, you know, just a shockingly small amount of offense generated in that game by the Leafs. Um, didn't, didn't put, didn't use their skill advantage, I guess. They didn't really push. I don't know if mentally they were fried, physically they're fried. You know, it's hard to get an answer on that, but honestly, through six games of the series, I still thought the Leafs were going to win the series. So it wasn't, until I started watching game seven that I thought, okay, they just don't got it. They don't have it. Cool. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> so, but then, guess, guess, well, so go ahead, go ahead. Oh, buddy. Sorry. Like did I, as a follow up to that. So it's three, one this year, it's three, nothing last year. It's five, one the year before out scored 11 to two in elimination or all or nothing games over the past three seasons. At what point is this a thing? Well, it's a thing right now. You know, it's, I think I, I look at the last two years in particular, uh, the, I thought Columbus game five and, and Montreal game seven felt eerily similar Yep. In, in that the Leafs didn't really give up a lot in those games. Yes. Jack Campbell makes a mistake on, on the goal by Brennan Gallagher. There's a one bad goal goes in in game five against Columbus. But like, to me, and I wrote this in my story, but I really believe a team as good as the Leafs when they're the favorite should be able to overcome one mistake in a game. I mean, there's, there's no flawless game that's played out there. You know, with the offense, they have the elite players they have. Being down one nothing, no matter how you got there, shouldn't be the death knell. And, 
you know, look, the Leafs did have some chances in game seven, but I, ju- I just feel as though they have to reevaluate a little bit how they're playing. And, you know, I think that there's a tension, right? And we all hit on them naturally for years. You don't play enough defense or too wide open, yada, yada, yada. Well, this year, look, they, they shut things down more. But I just wonder if in the process of doing that, they were a little too conservative at times, especially when they got into – a big game. And I think that they have to find a way to unlock their top players in those situations um, better. You know, I think that that rests on Sheldon Keith because he was a head coach for both of those two games, but, but it's a thing. And if there's a game seven next year, which it just feels like, God, there will be, it just feels like, I don't know who they're going to play. I don't know what circumstances will get them there, but it feels like we're going to see this again, that they're going to have to find a way not to play so tentative and, and to dictate the terms of the game to get a lead and to finally win one of those things. Do you have any explanation for the slow starts narrative? Because we thought it was Babcock at first all last season, and then Babcock's not here anymore, and it still see, still seems to be a problem. So is there is there any reason why the team seem uh, seems like they can't get ahead of the other team they're facing? I don't have a good one. You know, Jesse, other than, I guess, in, in the two games in particular where it was evident five and six in the series, Montreal is playing at those games for their life, right? I mean, they could their season can end that night. And so you would expect that there's a certain level of desperation there. You know, game six in particular, I actually went to the game in Montreal. I know it's only 2,500 fans. That was like a sugar rush after a year of not eating sugar. Like it was actually crazy how exciting it was to be in that building. Like I was shaking the entire game. I'm not exaggerating, not out of nerves for what was going to happen, but just like to be around people again and to feel that environment. Like I just couldn't calm my heart rate down and I'm just sitting there basically talking a couple times on TV and writing a story after the game. Like I don't have any important, you know, role in that night, but it just, the, the juice was there. And so I think that that, that had to help Montreal a little bit. I'm sure it helped Toronto too. Like there's no way they didn't feel that too, but it was a bit of a foreign experience. It actually makes me think whoever gets through, whether it's Montreal or Winnipeg, when they go down to the U S and play a game, presumably in front of potentially a full building somewhere that it, like that, that first game for them will be, a, it's like a culture shock or something when you haven't been through it, even though we've all lived that plenty in our lives before. It's just been so long. I'm getting off track here, but I, I don't, the, the, the short answer is I really don't have a good answer for it. I think there's got to be a little bit of paralysis here. I, I think that there is a mental block. I know all the guys keep saying there isn't, you know, how can I know? I'm not in their minds, but you just keep seeing the same thing over and over again it's hard not to believe that this has become a mountain that they got to climb and they just haven't found a way to summit the last peak. Well, and that's, that's what gets us to the, to the core four as they're being called, you know, the, the four guys up front and, you know, there was visible frustration and emotion and, you know, with Tavares, it's, it's more like, like, it's just good to see him. Okay. Yeah. Um, and, you know, talking about how he hadn't even seen the hit, doesn't want to see the hit based on his family's reactions um and then uh you know uh matthews is <laughs> matthews is pretty stone cold no matter what like he didn't seem too different um but mitch marner Superstar was swagger bud yeah well and, and mitch marner uh looked visibly visibly frustrated like nylander is sort of like a backseat to all this but um you know and he looked visibly frustrated on the bench and he looked uh like it was it was a tough series for him and so I think, you know, everybody's question going forward is, do you keep these four guys together? And is that the plan this offseason? I'm sure the plan can change, but, you know, you know, we discussed it a lot. 48% of Mitch Marner's contracts been paid already. I know similar for William Nylander. Um, are we going to see one of these guys, the we can and we will guys, moved out? I really don't believe you will. You know, and, and look, I'm not naive enough to believe, of course, Brendan Shanahan or Kyle Dubas isn't going to come out on the locker cleanout day and say like, yeah, we're looking to train one of these guys. Everything's on fire. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Like they're already there. The city's already half on fire. They don't need the other half to be burned down in the process. Right. So like no, no GM, no president shows all of his cards in that moment. You know, they're really just trying to get through that. I believe like just, it's such a shit show. Like that, that, that day when your team that just did what the Leafs did, I mean, it, it was chaos. I actually have never – I'm trying to see the good in it because part of me is like, wow, this is a little over the top. And then I'm like, you know what? This is why we like working here in my case or why you guys love this team. Like if people didn't care, it, it, didn't, it wouldn't 
have the same juice when it's good too. So, you know, I think there's, there's, there's probably 20 teams south of the border that looking at everything happening here as bad as it looks from afar. And they're like, man, we would take that because then your organization's making more money and you got, you can do more things like the Leafs can do. And so, you know, I, I think that, you know, so they didn't say they're going to trade anyone, but I actually believe them in this case. And I, I see some people out there being snarky about that stupid media, blah, 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 blah. I just don't think it makes sense at the end of the day. You know, when you look at where the Leafs are, no matter what you think of these individuals, there's just very few players like what they have. Like what they have is what other teams don't have. And, and I, I grant you that it creates problems. It's seen a steady flow of the middle class, right? Look at the last three seasons, the forwards they've lost. Andreas Janssen, Kasperi Kapanen, Nazem Kadri, James Van Riemsdyk, Tyler Bozak, you know, even Leo Komarov, which is maybe to a lesser extent. But, you know, the last Connor Brown, of course, oh. the last three years, like they have to keep losing, you know, valuable sort of middle middle parts of their lineup because you're top heavy. But I still think it's worth doing because the bet is that they're going to be able to replace that middle that middle mark. And I'm, I'm sure we'll get into Zach Hyman at some point during our chat today. But, you know, I do think that he's a little bit on the bubble here. You know, by no means – do I think he's gone, but it's, it's a really big decision for them because what he's worth at this point, it's going to be the core five almost, you know, because he's going to, I think he's going to get more than $5 million, honestly, unless they give him maybe an eight year contract, maybe or something like that. There's a way to get the AAV down, but if, you know, he's going to get five to 6 million in my opinion, based on the market. And so, yeah, it's, it's a challenge, but I, I think Kyle Dubas is all in on this. I really believe that he believes and if you could ever get one year, and this so far remains an if, where all four of those guys get in, in the playoffs and they're all rolling, I mean, it's going to be tough to beat them. And it's not to make excuses, but playing an entire series without John Tavares is a factor in why they lost to be yes. unmistakably. Like, I, I, and I'm not saying, again, it's not to let anyone off the hook. It's just a fact. And so yeah. I think you roll it back because you're hoping next year all four of them are playing, they're playing well, and that no team is going to be able to match up against that. So then I mean, what do you do? I mean, so uh, this morning I misquoted uh, Frank Saravalli with the podcast run with Jason Greger and him and, yeah. uh, and said, uh, I guess it was Jason that brought up that there was a rumor about Zach Hyman already being offered 5 million bucks a year by the Leafs. Uh, and Frank so kindly responded uh, that uh, that was incorrect. Frank's a, a bit abrupt on Twitter. I'm not sure if he is in real life, but, uh, um, but anyway. He's from Philly. He's... Yeah. Oh, okay, well then, there you go. What are you Adam, nuts? What are you nuts? <laughs> that makes sense. Love that. He was song. a five-year-old kid throwing a snowball at Santa Claus at an Eagles game once upon a time. So, like, <laughs> well, fair enough. So, uh, so it was Jason that brought that up. Obviously, the agent uh, today said absolutely no truth to that rumor. Um, is there any sort of chance that Zach Hyman does what we wished the stars would do? Takes a shave on the pay. And sticks around because, you know, there's – he loves the team and I don't know why else he would do it. <laughs> I don't think he should, if I'm being honest. Like, this is just me speaking, but, you know, all those guys got paid. He's been just as part of – you know, as much a part of the core of this team as them. Obviously, they have the high-end skills. They put up the bigger numbers. You know, I'm not saying he's been more valuable to the team as them, but those guys didn't take, you know, any pay cuts. And, and Zach's already probably played on a, on a deal that, that wasn't entirely fair for him. I, mean, I think he outperformed his last contract. It was $9 million total over four years. You know, those guys got signing bonuses larger than his entire contract. And he's been a valuable member of the team. He's been a no excuses, no bullshit, no complaints member of the team. This is his one opportunity as an NHL player to really cash it. And I think that this is where – this is why this story is interesting to me is because there's no doubt in my mind he'd prefer to stay in Toronto. I, I've got no small doubt that the Leafs aren't sincere and really wanting to keep him. But I do think that there's a chance that, that their business interests might not align, that, you know, that, that Zach, if he gets to the open market, is getting offers of like six years times six million or even seven years times six million. Like we're talking a lot of money. And – you know, it's hard for any of us to put ourselves in his shoes because we, I don't think anyway that we've been making the money he's been making, but you know, he's, he's taken a lot less than his teammates in these last few years. And this is his one shot at it. So, you know, if he ends up leaving, I hope there's no ill will his way. Uh, if he ends up staying on a deal, that's pretty rich. I think people should understand too, that, you know, it's hard. If you put yourself 
where he's been. He's worked just as hard as all these guys. He's been a part of it. He, I'm sure in his heart, he, he might believe he's not the fifth best of those five forwards. I've never asked him that. I, I would never expect him to answer that. But, you know, you got to be pretty proud to get as good at anything as he's got and, and work a lot pretty hard. So, you know, this, this all goes back to I wouldn't put my faith in him taking a hometown discount, nor, nor do I think he, sh- he should be expected to. And, you know, as a result of this, I, I wouldn't be entirely surprised to see him leave. I don't want that to be construed as he's leaving because mm-hmm. I really think this is an open question. I think there's still some a fair amount of discussion still to be had here before July 28th when he becomes a free agent. Uh, but it's, it's a tough call for him. I, you know, I, I don't envy his position because, look, at the, the end result here is he's going to get a payday. But I think this could be an emotionally difficult period if, if the Leafs just aren't coming up to the level that, that he you know, can expect from somewhere else. So with the Leafs, obviously, with the core four, um, you know, Kyle Dubas has been made fun of, you know, sort of for giving him all this money. And you seem down, bud. Sorry? You still seem down. I, I am. <laughs> Dude, I had, I've had two coffees, like, before, like, like within the last hour. And the Zach Hyman stuff's killing him, Chris. The, the Zach yeah. Hyman He's stuff so is – so low energy. It's, it's, it, here, let me try to pick it up. Trust me, I'm going to ramp up throughout this question because at some point, Dubas has got to say the bank of Kyle is closed. And it's killing me that Hyman could potentially be the end of the bank of Kyle. A guy who I wrote about, I think in 2015, maybe 2016, I spoke to Sheldon Keefe and Kyle Dubas individually and asked them who the most underrated players were on the team. They Your both, big J journal hat was on that day. It certainly was. Uh, and uh, they both said Justin Hall on defense. Look how that's played out. And they both said Zach Hyman at forward. Look how that's played out. Sheldon Keefe could not beam about the guy enough. He's a rock star in all our video sessions. He does everything we ask him to do. He's a winger, but we make him take face-offs on the penalty kill, which he's also part of. He's earned the right to be on the power play. He can drive his own line. He can be a complimentary player on his own line. He can be a finisher. He can go into the corner. They're not seriously going to draw the line at Zach Hyman, are they? He's also 29 and has had some injuries. And look, I don't want to be in a position where I'm arguing that they shouldn't sign him because it's not necessarily how I feel, but I, I just recognize how tough this is because it's not a slam dunk. It's a slam dunk in your mind. It's just not a, in your heart. Sorry. It's not a slam dunk in your mind. And there's risk when you, he's going to be 29 next season. And if you're signing him for six years or seven years or even eight years, there's a whole ton of risk in doing that. And I think what they have to decide is how important is the culture piece here? Like if he does, you know, aging curves are real. If, if, if you're not getting the kind of production out of him that you've seen the last couple of years, is he still valuable at the, those kind of numbers because of how he works and, and the way he conducts his life and the parties played in this team? I mean, I actually see him a little bit as like Alex Kalorn in Tampa, right? You know, Tampa's solution with Kalorn when they faced similar cap challenges was to give him a long-term deal at that, you know, sort of middle of the road. AAV. I mean, maybe there's a path there. I'm not saying the exact terms of that, that contract. Th- that contract's killing them, right? Well, that's the thing. You're just trying to delay the pain when you do that. It's like it's like me putting off my taxes. The problem is April 15th comes every year. I mean, <laughs> I, I hate I hate doing it, but like like it, like you can you can try to pay them a little bit less here, and it's okay for one year or two years. But then what happens if Sandine pops or Nick Robertson pops? Like, and you got to pay those guys like. It, there's going to be it's this is the cap just kills you death by a thousand cuts. It's so hard to stay competitive over a long period of time. Some teams do it. It re, it actually requires a certain degree of ruthlessness, I think, rather than locking into players on the wrong side of thirty and that bad cap numbers. You know, it, it's easier to do that in Chicago, where you at least have three banners that are providing a nice draft through your building, even if you got Brent Seabrook's deal on on your, your cap ledger. You know, Toronto's in a tough spot because they've lost all those guys I mentioned earlier and they haven't yet won anything. And now potentially they could lose Zach Hyman. You know, I, th- I think we have to open our minds to the possibility, though. Look, this is where they're going to get cap space this year, in my opinion. I believe, well, hmm, it's, t- it's a little soon. I think it's possible they lose Alexander Kerfoot in the Seattle expansion process. You know, I've heard that that, that is someone that, that Seattle would like, you know, I depending on what they do with, with their protection rules, you know, there's a, there's a world where he's exposed. That's three and a half million. If it happens, 
course, they could trade him too if, if that isn't the case. You know, you got Freddie Anderson's five million coming off the books. You, you need another goalie, mm-hmm. but you're probably going to try to spend less than five million to re- replace that spot on the roster. So let's say for fun, you get another three million there. So you're up to six and a half. You know, Hyman made what two and a half this year. Uh, so that's it. You're at about nine million, and then that's not counting Simmons, and you know, you're probably not bringing back potentially Thornton. You know, they're going to have like 11 to 12 million bucks if they don't bring Hyman back. But what happens if they pay him five and a half? You're down, you know, the money, it just, it's something bad. Okay, put it this way. If you're an emotional Leafs fan, I think there's going to be one move this offseason that's going to be hard to stomach. And, you know, I think the core four are there, but maybe bringing back Hyman, potentially trading Morgan Riley, although I don't think that that's likely. You know, something like that might happen to just to create the cap space to, to make a larger move, bringing somebody in. And and if you were to say if the, if Brendan Shanahan and Kyle Dubas were you know taking truth serum, and they were in on in this conversation right now, what would you say is is their main goal? Like, and don't say resign Zach Hyman because that's I mean obviously, but like in terms of main weakness that needs to be addressed on this team, they need to solidify the goaltending position, and. I think that they need to be better defensively, even still a, a stouter blue line, mm. um, which might seem sort of counterintuitive. Look, they, they cut down on all the key defensive metrics this year significantly. They, they certainly played better team defense. But, you know, just for, maybe I'm being influenced by some of the people I've talked to since the loss. You know, people work for other teams. You know, the Leafs are a constant source of interest, even around the league. Like, it's amazing how many people reach out and want to talk about, oh, what are they going to do? This is what I would do. Amazingly, a lot of the hockey men are still saying they should trade Nylander. I'm sure, <laughs> oh I'm sure that will stun you. <laughs> I guess. Yeah, no way. I, I should be clear too. I've, I've, I'm on Team Willie. If there's there's teams here, I think you can win with him. Um, but that that's been a common refrain. But I, I I think that if they can bolster the blue line, that that should be something to look at. And then they probably need a bit more flexibility up front. You know, I think really the goal is, and this is really boring, but they got to make the team better. They, they have to make a team that they have to find a way, even with all the restrictions and with everybody getting a year older, to have better, more better players that in case next year they get to the playoffs, maybe face even better team than Montreal and face injuries. because Injuries happen everyone, to everyone that they can find their way through. So I, I don't think it's just one area, but I'm curious to see what they do with that other goaltending slot. You know, I, I think that they address that potentially by trade rather than free agency because – the free agent crop of goalies isn't uh, that sexy. What about a guy like Dougie Hamilton, who's a UFA? Can't rule him out. You know, he's right in their wheelhouse, the kind of guy they'd like. Now, you know, from what I've heard, I think the numbers in, in Carolina that they've talked are somewhere, like I think the team wants somewhere around $6 million-ish. Uh, you know, I would imagine Dougie wants $8 million-ish. Um, so if Toronto – even if it's not Dougie Hamilton, it would be really difficult to imagine Toronto committing $8 million to any individual player coming in while keeping everyone here. You know, it makes them more top-heavy. Perhaps that would have, that would, that kind of move might fit, I guess, if you're getting rid of Morgan Riley's $5 million. This is pure spitball, and this is... Yeah. This is not like Kyle Dubas whispered any of this into my ear. Or anything. No, no. Sorry, we should, wanna... we should say that, though, because this will get quote tweeted. Well, I don't want to misrepresent the tone of the conversation here yeah. for anyone who's playing it back at two to three times speed and disseminating it online. Um, but, you know, maybe they get that way. I just think they're going to have to be a bit bold, guys. And I'm not talking bold trade Mitch Marner because I really don't believe that's going to happen. But I don't, I don't think they're ro- – they actually could roll back more or less the same team, believe it or not. Even signing Zach Hyman, like like the, within the cap, they can make that work. I just don't believe that's the the route they're going to go. You know, I think that it's hard to sell that, and I think it's hard to sell even to the players inside the dressing room where there's got to be a little bit of doubt, right? Just the smallest kernel of doubt, like why can't we get this done? Like the questions we're having trouble answering, I think the guys on the ice can't answer them all either about why they failed to get this across the goal line. And so, you know, I think that they're going to have to change things up there and be a little bit more dynamic, probably less old guys in the bottom of the lineup. I was just going to ask about that. Well, so I have an observation and, and two questions. The, the observation is, boy, is it going to suck when Jake Gardner hands the cup to Morgan Riley next year when Carolina wins it? <laughs> um, the, to put a bow on the Zach Hyman thing, um, 
Josh Anderson last year gets 5.5 million per seven years, 38 and a half million. Do you think Hyman gets a higher AAV than that? Um, can't really get longer term than that, but do you think he gets the max term? And do you think the full contract is more than what Anderson got? If he leaves Toronto, he's getting a higher AAV than that. Wow. Wow. If, higher, higher than 5.5. Yeah. If he stays, no. there's probably a world where he gives them that small. Like, I mean, I'm saying small. We're talking a couple hundred thousand a year, but I think that maybe they can keep him a little bit under that on a long term deal. But that's the range. Honestly, that's, and look, he's earned it. As yep. a human, you should be happy for him. I yeah. agree. It's, I agree. It's, it's just hard because, you know, you might be at the point where the team has to go like, you know what? We love the guy, but if we do that, it's just going to prevent, it's going to get in our way down the road. Right. So, and the final thing was one of my all time wrong takes was after Columbus got, uh, Columbus swept Tampa. I, I did this impassioned speech. I'm like, there's no way the guys in the lightning can look around their room and look at the guy across from them and go, I can do it with this group. There's no way they can be thinking that right now. What did they do? They somehow added <laughs> to that group and they kept, they basically kept the entire band together and they go and they're unstoppable, a juggernaut, you might even call them. <laughs> and they win the Stanley cup. How do the Leafs, what, what, what did Tampa do that the Leafs can take a lesson from? They didn't overreact. Mm. You know, this is this is where it's hard because I know fans want – I get it. Everyone's frustrated that, that cares about the team, but they just – they didn't overreact. Like, Julian Breezeball's press conference after they got swept by Tampa was quite similar, actually, to a lot of what we heard from Kyle Dubas, I thought, on Wednesday. It, it's about – it's so hard to build this kind of core. You just got to ride it forever, keep tinkering around the margins, hope to get the mix right, hope to get the right – set of circumstances who you're playing all that sort of stuff better injury luck as lame as it sounds it's the yeah. truth you know it, i i, I right. think that's what they did like they added luke shen zach bogosian and then they made trades for barkley goodrow and uh Blake Blake Coleman. Coleman. Mm -hmm. that's essentially what they did like that was the entirety of what they did from the team that got swept by tampa to the team that just marched to the cup final and do you know what's hilarious if you look at tampa in 2020 the year they won the cup they got all their scoring from their top line, like basically exclusively, and Victor Hedman. Like nobody in their bottom six put up any points in the playoffs. If you go back and look, like I'm talking a handful of points in 20-odd games. Like the Leafs in the first round got, what, six points from Alex Kerfoot, five from uh -huh. Jason Spezza, a couple goals from Jake Muzzin, a goal from TJ Brody. Like they actually got more depth scoring in that series than I think Tampa got at any point in last year's playoffs. You know, what didn't happen was the big guys didn't dominate, at least on the score sheet. And, and holy cow. Sorry to sorry, just – uh, <laughs> CJ wasn't kidding. Holy smokes. So Kucherov at 34, Braden Point at 33. Then it's an enormous drop-off to Victor Hedman, who had 22. And he's the only other Lightning uh, player who had over 20. It's Palat with 18, Gord 14. It's a very, very sharp drop off from that. Yeah, and they didn't line. even have Stamkos because he was out with yes. the injury. Point yes. of game, though. One game, one goal, five shifts. I was in the <laughs> building. It was unreal. Now, yeah. I'll tell you. So I think the Leafs are built, honestly, on the bet that one of these years, their big guys will, care, will have a similar kind of thing. Obviously, any capable players below them that aren't getting fed in on their during their minutes you almost just want the third and fourth lines to break even score the odd big goal mm -hmm. and then you need Matthews and Marner or Nylander and Tavares or some version of the four to go ham for four rounds and you probably win a cup I think that's I actually think that that is what the bet of these Toronto Maple Leafs boils down to and if that doesn't happen it's a lot on those guys shoulders but that's that's why they get half the salary cap that's right. the flip side of this conversation and I'm not pinning the loss entirely on them but you, you just can't get around the fact that, you know, one goal in seven games from those players, if they get one more, if they get two more, if they get three more, I mean, they're playing Winnipeg tonight. So with that, Chris, you know, there are questions arising. I brought it up in the last show. Um, you know, Matthews, I, he didn't look great, but you feel like with him, you can figure it out. Uh, what I saw from Mitch Marner to me personally was a guy that disappeared. 
uh, the style of play just did not suit his style of play. He's an incredible perimeter player. But this is a guy that never never drives the net. I understand that's not his style. I understand that he's made a career and makes $11 million doing that. Good for him. But my question is, does Mitch Marner have the ability to perform in the playoffs? He hasn't scored a goal in 18 playoff games. Um, does he have the shot to do it? And, and, and frankly, you know, people are able to out-physical him in the playoffs. And I hate to make it about that. I understand from a stats perspective, especially an analytics perspective, the value that Mitch Marner has. And I'm a Mitch Marner fan. But what I saw was a guy that completely disappeared and then got really nervous. I mean, Arpan Basu's tweet, I think, before game six or game seven kind of said it all. He said, Mitch Marner is nervous. I have never seen him like this. I think it was mid-game seven. Mid-game, whatever. Oh, no, I think it was pre-game, wasn't it? I don't know. Anyway, long story short, you know, can... You know, can Mitch Marner do this? Is he capable of this? Does he have to change anything up? How do you think he looks at going into this summer? Because the focus seems to be on him mostly with Leafs Nation. The question is fair, but I, I really do believe he can figure it out. Honestly, right. his whole life he's been small, right? Like, and he was dominant when London won the Memorial Cup. I get it. Not the same thing. We're talking so many, about men, yeah. different stage. But I, I would still be betting on him if I were the Leafs. And I think that's why they're comfortable doing so. There's no question that when the dust settles on this, like Mitch Marner wasn't right these last two weeks. You know, I can only guess at everything going wrong, the pressure, what's being said, maybe just the fact he's trying really hard and it's not working and he doesn't, he's almost out of answers. He's frustrated. You know, he wasn't himself. He wasn't dynamic. I don't think it was a lack of care or or anything. It just, the execution wasn't there. And I do think when the dust settles, like this is still a very emotional time. He's just getting, you know, he's being raked over the coals, frankly. And that's fine. I'm not saying it's unfair, but like, I think when, once the emotions of this pass, because this too shall pass, just like everything we all deal with good and bad in our lives, he's got it. He has to have some honest reflection. I think the organization, the coaching staff management have to talk with him and they have to, they have to make a plan for why it'll be different next time. And, and, things he can do because there are things he can do i mean on any ice sheet he's on he's basically the most skilled player and again i think he's wired for success i don't think he's a guy that's doing too much else in his life like he's playing some video games maybe a little golf in the summer a bit of cottage time but like he eats sleeps breathes hockey has his whole life and i just think he's still young enough that i uh, i wouldn't make too many dramatic conclusions based on these 12 days or even you know, what happened in the bubble last year or the year before against Boston. Like, it's – the criticism is fair. He goes 18 games without a goal in, in the playoffs. Like, people are going to bring that up, and they're going to question this. and They're going to doubt him. Like, it's up to him. Now, people have doubted him again because of his size for a long time. It's up for him to push back against that, to make sure he's doing everything he needs to this summer. And I do think some honest self-reflection about what happened here. And, and this is where it's hard – for me to comment too closely because I, I really don't know everything that was going on behind the scenes or in his mind, but we all saw, you, you couldn't deny that it wasn't the same player. Mm-hmm. And I think when it really started going sideways, it went sideways. And, you know, with Mitch, I always feel like anything that doesn't work, it's almost a product of caring too much. It's not the opposite where he's just like, yeah, whatever. Um, you know, I think, I think he really wants to, to find a way and, and, I, I'm giving it at least one more year before a, a playoff hockey in these kind of circumstances before I'm making those kind of conclusions. There are two. Oh, sorry. Go oh, ahead. I, was, I just want to know what you, what do you make of the the pile on that kind of happened afterwards uh, after Game Seven, specifically the uh, the reporting of the power play, him not wanting to play down low, and then the uh, the viral he was playing golf the next day. Did you did you have any takeaways from those two those two instances? I found the whole thing a little ridiculous. I know he wasn't playing golf. <laughs> that one I know isn't true. You know, I don't even if he was, was if cares? he was, who cares? Like, yes, that's also true. Yeah. Like, <laughs> um, man, we look the social media world. Like, I still struggle with it. Like, I love so much of it, but it got it got nutty out there, man. Mm-hmm. It got crazy. Like, actually, when I walked outside the building after Game Seven. I was doing a TV hit in Maple Leaf Square with Sean McKenzie, my sports tech colleague. And there was a, a young man in a martyr jersey. He's like, I'm leaving this year. And he like ran over and left it on uh, Legends Row there. And he was trying on to the get stick. 
trying trying to get the cameras to film them. I, I'm sure some did. I didn't see the footage. I just saw it live. Oh, gee. You know, people were angry and they just, they don't know where to put their anger, I guess. Uh, but this is, you know what? The flip side of this, this is this is what it is to be on a big big league team in a big city where people care. So, you know, I, I think it's awful. You know, I don't like anything that's directed in terms of a threat towards his family, anyone coming to his house or anything like that. I think that stuff is nonsense. But I mean, look, there's going to be criticism, and and I think that should be expected too. The PowerPoint thing is interesting. Like, I, I think that there might be a kernel of truth to it, as far as I can tell, like a small kernel in that. My understanding is he prefers to play the spot he played on the power play, which makes sense. He's been there a long time. Sure. Um, but I, I don't know. I can't remember how it was characterized. I don't think he like refused or, you know, I think that maybe, you know, the fact that that stuff comes out right after a game seven, it just feels like you wonder about the motives of everything going on. I'm not even saying with the intellect, um, you know, reporting it then. It's like, who's telling him that, that, then and why, you know what I mean? It just feels feels a little dirty to me you know the least power play struggled for months you know why why is that coming out that the minute after game seven again i'm not blaming ian necessarily but who's telling him that and why and why was it characterized i think in the worst way possible that isn't reflective of reality and and you know man there's just a lot of shit when your team loses so then with that, Chris, um, you know, that is a, a bone of contention with Leafs Nation that sort of got lost in in the fallout from Game 7. Uh, one of the things we talked about on the last show was if that rumor were true, um, part of it would make sense, not in the sense that that sounds like a Mitch Marner thing to do because it doesn't. Um, but it, what, what was interesting was that it seemed that they didn't really make any adjustments. Power play dries up and they continue to throw out and do the same thing. And a lot of fans, rightly so, laid that at the feet of Manny Malhotra. Um, and obviously the players on the ice. So there's a lot of people who are upset that Joe Thornton was consistently out there when William Nylander was an absolute monster in the series. Um, what do you make of how, much of how much of that lays at the feet of the coaching staff? And will there be changes with the assistant coaches? It doesn't seem as if there, though there are going to be changes, at least to start the off season. Although, you know, it might be a little too soon to say they might not have made that, that judgment just yet. You know, what I make of it is they actually made tons of adjustments, but what's strange is that it wasn't until that final power play in game seven, when you had Sheldon Keefe down at the front of the bench, sort of diagramming a play for them that they put William Nylander on the opposite flank to Austin Matthews, kind of the way they played in their rookie season and had some success. Like, they waited. That was the one change they didn't do for an awfully long amount of time. But if you look back through the regular season, like they, they were going load up one unit, split them between two units. You know, Rasmus Sandin got his, his turn on the top power play unit, both late in the regular season and in the playoffs. Like, I feel like they tweaked a lot. It just, none of it to any great effect. And it doesn't make sense that this team can't find a way with the power play. Like, like, but this, this has been an be issue. a huge priority. Cause yeah, you're right down the stretch uh, last season too. Yeah, it was an issue for them. And it, 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 you watch what Colorado is doing right now, or even Boston, like those teams whip it around. You know, Edmonton, obviously McDavid's a cheat code, but still, Tampa, they, they, they those those teams all they they make it so that it like they're so skilled that you can't help but take penalties against them because they're so good, and then they they make you pay for doing that. And the the thing with Montreal, who had you know a little bit more of a thuggish type approach to this series, they want you know phys, being physical is how they're built. That's what they wanted to do. There was there's a little bit less fear, I think, about crossing the line because the Leafs really didn't make them pay. I know they ended up scoring, I think, three power play goals in the series. But, you know, again, they were one of the – I think they were 13th of the 16 teams when I looked in the playoffs. Like, if they were the top power play in the league in the playoffs, they're still playing in the second round. There's just no way around that. And, it, and yeah. it's my instinct to say to you, but, yeah – like the, the low percentage is the difference of what one or two goals. And then I just look at that series and I'm like, Jesus, do you win the oh, series? Yeah. You have one, one, you have oh, one you or two it. goals. Like, what? and, and Chris, uh, go back to game one is, guys. And game one was so weird, right? The John Tavares yeah. thing is scary and awful, yeah. but they have a power play in the third period of a one, one game. And what do they do? They give up the shorthanded goal to Byron. Like yeah. if they score there, instead of giving up the shorthanded goal, you know, they're up one, nothing. Maybe they sweep the series. Like maybe they still win the next three games. Like Ugh. I realize you, you're, you're playing the, coulda woulda shoulda but they were one shot away in that game they were one shot away in game five and one shot away in game six and even game seven they didn't get blown out they just didn't have anything left 
But I, I, I think, sorry, what I meant by the, the tweaks is that it seemed like, yes, they, they changed people in and out. And, and I don't know why they would have waited till the last power play of the whole damn season to put Nylander in there. I think, I think if we've learned anything, you got to put the best players together to score a fucking goal. But especially when you need one goal, <laughs> when you need one goal. But the other thing is, is mm. it's, it's, it seemed, Chris, like the way they play the power play in, in terms of the system itself, um, the only guy that I really saw, I mean, Tavares would be a guy that would be in tight. Uh, William Nylander is a guy that scores a, go- a ton of goals in tight. Wayne Simmons scores goals in tight. But he was, unfortunately, he was very effective at the beginning of the season, then had the injury, then it just never seemed to come back for him. Um, the, the way they played that just never seemed to click. And I wonder... Um, and I know that they are these guys. I mean, we saw it with Cody CC last year. They're hard on their, like they're hard to, they're hard to move off their guys once they have their guys. But, um, there is no excuse for this there. You know, it's like, you know, the Lakers are out. You need LeBron to be, um, you need LeBron to be performing at least, uh, you know, you, you the, the Clippers, same thing with Kawhi with that air, you know, the air ball, like you need, yes, you got to have supporting cast, but if this if this team doesn't score from its 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 star players in a position to score, I don't know. Like I I don't I didn't see a lot of driving the net. I heard that they were tougher. I heard that they were grittier. But when you go on the power play, there's like the one thing that the Leafs power play has lacked is James Van Riemsdyk for a couple of years. And as much as he was a problem and the contracts a problem in Philly, man, when he was on that power play in front of the net, tipping things all the time, they were pretty dominant. And it he was hasn't magic. been the same since. He was magic down there. His hands oh. are ridiculous. Yes. You know, they have to rip it up and start again. I mean, you have you have the best pure shooter in the world. And you have tons <laughs> of other players with high, high-end, you know, offensive abilities. You can't tell me that there's not a way to make that work. But you're right. The system didn't work. I think the problem, of course, which more than just me identified, on the top unit, they really have the one guy who shoots, who scares you. So you just fade Matthews. I think that that's why it makes sense with Nylander because Nylander has a low-key ridiculous shot. You know, we don't – it's funny. He scores so many goals from in tight, like even at five-on-five, you don't see him like really cock it up anymore sometimes. But like he he can fire the puck. And so I think that that you probably get back to having at least Matthews and Nylander build a unit around the fact that both those guys can shoot and pass and that gives you deceptive options. Yeah, I'm curious what we'll see from Rasmus Sandy next year. I assume he's going back to top power play duty in a full season. You know, I guess if there's any hope in all this for fans, like once this wears off, like they're probably going to be better next year. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know that that's like false. Like, I'm not expecting anyone to be fired up about that, but like they're going to, I think that they will come back with different players and a different approach. And there's every chance they're even more dangerous. Um, but the power play, it's like the, the margins are so fine in a series like the one they played with Montreal. Like you almost can't lose this series. They scored four more total goals. They got a better save percentage from the goalie, more high danger chances, more scoring chances, more shot attempts, more unblocked shot attempts, more shots on goal. Like they did everything but win. And I, I got... <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's true. No one wants to up. hear that. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> but like, you couldn't lose a series like that. Like, only only, <laughs> only few Toronto. teams could lose a series with those kind of lines. Man, like yeah. like the Habs were like in the Matrix. That's probably a dated reference for your audience, but just like dodging bullets everywhere, right? Like, you know, that game six, they have ten straight shots in overtime. Like, I've never seen that. They're, the Habs are playing 4D. Like, their guys are just on fumes. And they get one chance and score. Like, it... it man, it's, it's, it's crazy. Montreal now has its first four-game winning streak in two years. Oh, oh goodness. I didn't even this know This happens that. to be the three the three games where they stave off elimination and then the first game against Winnipeg. What, what are you doing to me? I like, hate this. I fucking hate this. <laughs> I well, that, and I my love you. Tweet. I've been justified. <laughs> yeah, man, you look like a fucking genius now. <laughs> like I was playing 3D chess all along with you guys. Uh, man. Brian, well, 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 CJ, we should have known all along with you that it's uh, it's not a sprint; it's a marathon. <laughs> oh. oh, I like what you did. There you go. Um, Brian Burke came on this show in December, and That's awesome. 
He predicted yes. that the Canadians Boo. were the best uh, built team for the playoffs in the North Division. And now that we see it unfolding, like there's so much truth in it and that this team can just grind and play quote unquote playoff hockey. And that is that is that a style? Because that was the the um, the idea last offseason for the Leafs. You get these these tougher guys and then maybe you're you're better in the playoffs and it just doesn't work because like this Montreal team outgridded you. So going into next year, it's not get more like Montreal or is it double down on the scoring? Like, what do you what do you do to combat a team like this? Knowing Kyle Dubas as I do a little bit, like I feel like he's going to go back a little bit the other way and maybe get away from some of the the experienced gritty guys. The the grit per sixty is going to go down next season. I think I think he'll lean back into his his vision. That's not to say they'll completely abandon it. Don't get me wrong. Like I, I think someone like Zach Bogosian, for example, there's a good chance he's back. Um, you know, there's still going to be some elements on the roster of that, but. I think you have to be true to who you are. Like there's not one way to win, right? The, the Canadians have obviously hit on a way to grind out wins. You know, they had some success in the bubble last year in similar fashion, but you know, the Canadians look at the Leafs and they go like, man, if we just had a player like Matthews or a player like Marner, like they, you know, what they're missing is those elite players. You know, I wonder if the NHL, I'm sure you guys all saw this bouncing around that list of, you know, the 18 top players in the league, yep. 17 yep. of them are out, you know, by the start of the second round. Like th- this is a broader discussion than just the Leafs top guys, but you just wondered like to the top offensively skilled players, you know, is, is the playoffs not suited for them just in general, maybe the way it's called or the way that the style of play goes. For sure. You know, the way it's called for sure. The way it's called. Yeah. I, I do agree with that. And if I'm an Oilers fan, I'm pissed because oh. like zero drawn calls on McDavid is an, an atrocity. Eight, eight straight playoff games for him, Steve. No calls. No yes. calls. It's it's like it, <laughs> like like someone should lose their job over that. Like that's that's legitimately terrible. Nobody loses their job at, at head office in the NHL. No, no. And yet, I I would love to make that excuse for the Leafs, and I have in the past with Boston. It just wasn't a thing this year. My opinion, it wasn't particularly egregious, right? No, no, and and you know, I'm just trying to explore all the things here. I mean, I, I just think the Leafs. What makes them special is those those players, right? They have more elite players than basically every team in the league. There's maybe a handful we could debate, but they're certainly in the top percentile of of elite players on the roster. And so I think that they're going to, rather than go completely the other direction, I think they're going to lean into skill and try to come back a little bit more skilled than they were this year, next year. Just, just might feel on it. Uh, it's Seattle time. It's officially Seattle time for, for this fan base. Kraken. Seven in the Kraken. So let's get cracking on this there, CJ. <laughs> whoa. Hey, whoa. <laughs> that joke. Hey, oh. There you go. So seven and three, four and four. What do they do? Cause I think they go four and four. All right, so which who's the fourth defenseman you're worried about? Let me call up Cap Friendly just so I can get a look here. Well, Riley's got a year left, and this is part of the reason why I think they consider trading him. I have no desire for the Leafs to trade Morgan Riley. I just don't want to see them lose him for nothing. Riley's got a year left. Hall, I think, has two. And then I want to say Muzzin and so if you're Brody protecting, both have three or four. Let's frame the discussion. If you're protecting 3D... Are we agreed sure. that it would be Ro- Muzzin, Riley, and Brody that would be protected? Yeah, I think so. I think losing Hall for nothing's probably not a great move. So that's why you go to four and four because you're worried about Hall, essentially. Yeah. Because at four, they're obviously protecting the big four. <laughs> if they're bringing those guys back, four four automatic pr- protection slots. Yep. Your fifth choice, if you know, it depends if they sign Zach Hyman by then or not. Right. Uh, um, you know, then you have Alex Kerfoot at six, you know, and I don't know if you're too worried about the rest of this group, you know, Angvalls and, and even Mikheyev. I think you just exposed those guys. That's the thing. Uh, yeah. I mean, you could go four and four. And if you do that, I think you're probably losing uh, Kerfoot. Kerfoot's like, a really useful player. He is. And maybe they can, you know, have their cake and eat it too and trade him for – somebody and it's somebody they're able to keep and or maybe it's even a he's in a package for a goalie of some sort like i mean 
No, but and then, you, you trade him for a package for a goalie. You need to protect the goalie. That's right. Yeah, yeah. I didn't think of that. Anyway, and you're still losing a player. Like you got to lose yes. someone. So if you're trading someone away, you still lose an additional player to the guy you're trading. Oh, they're going to lose a better player than last time. That's for sure. They yeah. lost Brendan Leipzig, and I and I moaned about that because I liked him with the Marlies, and well, we all know how well that aged. You were so but, upset, man. All takes exposed. <laughs> wrong, straight up wrong. But like this year, we're talking about names like Kerfoot and Hall, and Dermot keeps getting brought up, and like, like this isn't I nothing. Think Dermot we're might just... get through, man. Yeah. That's it's for some reason Leafs Twitter is latched on to him, and I'm like, he's an RFA. What do you, an RFA who was like this team's sixth, seventh defenseman this year? Yeah, I'm just thinking that like he's not. We still don't really know what he is, right? I'm not sure another team is automatically taking him. Now he's only 24, right? He's and not. the success of Vegas. I mean, there's like a lot of things that went well for Vegas, but one of the things I think you could learn is that. It took a lot of players that were about 24 or 25 and gave them a chance to tire up the lineup than they'd ever had with their previous teams. And a lot of them hit, right? You, you look at their entire front, you know, first line with, with Marcia. So and William Carlson and Riley Smith, like all those guys went bonkers, you know, Nate Schmidt played top four minutes for them, like right away. And, you know, in Washington, he was in and out of the, the, the lineup, all that kind of thing, you know, and then they got a good goaltender and Mark Henry Fleury, you know, and some other guys down the lineup. But, like, I think the lesson there was they just gave some guys some chances they haven't had. Like, maybe if, you, if you're if you if you're not trying to win a Stanley Cup, which I don't think Seattle is in year one, and you play Travis Durbin in the top four, maybe it works. But, you know, I don't think it's a slam dunk they take him. I, I think they, if, if it came down to where the Leafs have exposed, say, Dermott um, and Kerfoot, I think they're probably taking Kerfoot. And – just to get back to something too, when it co- comes to player acquisition, because I forgot to ask this question. I hope you guys don't mind. Do you think Kyle Dubas would have redone the trade deadline if he could do it? Yes. Hmm. Okay. Nick wow. Foligno. Was Nick Foligno injured before Very he got injured? Him? Before? So he was very, not when he got him. Okay. Something happened. Oh. Something happened after he got here. Okay. Okay. Because like, that was uh, what we heard last show, and yes, I was ready we to did hear I was ready to punch the screen. <laughs> there was no, there was some confusion on this. He missed the last game with Columbus, like that he could have played, that he was eligible to play. And I was told by someone who would know that that was just a, they preemptively were sitting in to protect him, essentially because they knew they were going to trade him. Okay. Um, and okay. I think it might have been a very minor injury, but it wasn't whatever the injury was. You know, I think it was his back in the playoffs. I heard. Oh. Jesus. Um, and yeah. So then, and I don't know. I don't know the extent of the injury, but it was clear. He could, you know, I even heard from one of the Montreal players, like they're like, it just wasn't Nick Foligno. Like he, he wasn't engaging in scrums. Like he wasn't playing with that kind of edge he's always played with, I think just because he was really struggling to be out there. I, I, I feel for the guy. We actually didn't hear from him on the locker cleanup day, but he wanted this so badly. You know, he, he you know, potentially could have went somewhere else. He wanted to come to Toronto. He had the whole Mike Foligno, his hat thing, you know. I think he wanted this to work and he played through injury, but he just, he couldn't, couldn't be himself. Well, this is what happens when you trade high draft picks for guys that have played a grinding style for their entire career, right? Like this is, that is the risk you run. Um, you, you know what they were going for. Would they, what stopped them from going out and getting Taylor Hall? Two things. I think they, they felt they didn't need more scoring, which ultimately, <laughs> I think that, that, I that there's room for scrutiny vomit. there. And if they did that, I'm pretty sure they they might not have even been able to make any subsequent trades. Like you're probably not getting another goaltender just because of the cap space. Like Taylor, even Taylor Hall's eight million half retained is four million. If you look at the total cap hits of all the guys they got and they gave up more draft picks to get retained salary in those deals, somewhere in that neighborhood. So it was going to be a tougher contract to fit in. And even though the David Riddick thing didn't work out, like, remember what he was. He was Michael Hutchinson insurance. It was a very like, good they, idea. When they were making that decision, Freddie Anderson was still hurt. So they didn't know if he'd come back, what he looked like, what he could come back. You had Jack Campbell, who was nursing his own injuries, and Michael Hutchinson was your backup. So that was to try to prevent, I say this with respect, but like they didn't want circumstances to play where they had Michael Hutchinson playing a game seven. What? Sorry, Steve, just one more question on sure. that. If they could do it again, Chris, how do you think the trade deadline goes? What do they do? Well, I guess maybe this is where 
maybe he doesn't have regrets. I think the regrets are you gave up six draft picks and you got seven playoff games and those, <laughs> all those players really had no factor in the series at all. Mm-hmm. Um, so, but I don't know that the approach would actually change. Like that's the funny thing. Uh, you know, maybe they look at Hall instead. That, that's probably yeah. if they're being honest. If if they're if they're they're doing their true serum thing, which we like to have that that sort of like not what they're saying to us in front of a Zoom camera, but talking amongst themselves in the boardroom. Maybe they look at that again. And and again, that's why I do think they're going to lean into more offense. Like maybe get away from this idea of role players and all this stuff. You know, get have some of that. But you know, why not just go be the team that that no team can contain. You know, I think that that's, that's their identity. That's how this is going to work or not work. You know, you're not going to magically turn any of these guys into, to grinders. Like the whole, I think the whole Steve Eisenman narrative is a giant narrative that is only rooted in half truths anyway, but yeah, you know, it's a bit that's weird. kind. That's kind. Right. It, like, it's just like this weird thing that's been like just repeated over time, passed down from generation to generation. This, this myth of, you know, the way Steve Eisenman's career evolved as opposed to maybe just Detroit got a lot better players around him by the time he was 32 and they finally won a cup. Yeah. Uh, Fedorov in his peak is what happened. Yeah. yeah. Well, and isn't it, it weird strong. his scoring yeah. his scoring went down as league scoring plummeted? Yeah. <laughs> it's weird, isn't it? And like, as he got older and less skilled. Whoa, this like, guy who played in the mid 80s all of a sudden stopped scoring in the mid 90s. What happened? Hockey. Hockey happened. Sorry. You knew yeah, his own so trap. I, I, I think probably they go and get Taylor Hall. I mean, with, with hindsight. Look, t- Taylor only cost a second-round pick for Boston. We've oh. seen what he's doing to this. As we're recording this, he's been really good in the playoffs and good down the stretch. And I think he wanted to play here, too. Like, I, I don't uh, – I can't keep track of hockey Twitter. Like, so many rumors come and go. I can't remember what was a real rumor or not. But the one thing I know to be true is it was not Boston or bust for him. It just – when it came down to the end and he had some choice between a couple teams – Boston was one was one of the, where he wanted to go, but I, I right. think, you know, he owns a house in Toronto. He lives here in the off season. I think I think he would have been a Leaf if if the Leafs wanted to make him a Leaf. This is torture. Yeah, you're saying some terrible things here, Chris. This is. Uh... Well, I mean, you're no, you're saying some truthful things. <laughs> the uh, truth really fucking hurt. hurts. You yeah. are not responsible for the truth. The but, truth, you know, I don't truth. think they were ever that serious about getting him, honestly. Like, I, I which just, is worse. That's that's an indictment because that's been their whole mantra, has it not? Get the best player available. Yeah, but uh, this year they obviously embarked on this idea that they felt that they were missing some of that sandpapery. You know, they wanted, you know, there's not really, there's no Wendell Clarks anymore, but they wanted guys that played with that certain passion and edge and, and would, would not buckle when it mattered. And, and, you know, the, the trouble is, it's just their best players that didn't get them through the series. Like they, yeah. they score yeah. one more goal and we're just talking about all these decisions so much differently. Like that's, that's, what's crazy. I think that's where, when you're in management, you got to just step away from the noise a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, the boy blunder headlines and all this stuff because you know I, <laughs> I i think that like the second guessing in some ways is it i get why everyone's like there's no excuse for losing that series but they didn't lose it by much and if they win that series and beat winnipeg and you know we're looking at all these decisions a little bit differently like it's a matter of one goal and yeah. you know Ooh. john Tavares got knocked out in like the freakest injury you could ever imagine it's horrible yeah like like, there's no way they lose that series with Tavares in it. I'll, I'll come out and say that. And I'll stand by it. I Who could argue against you? Who could? And no Habs fan is going to argue against you. They were all as surprised as, as the rest of us. Hey, CJ, since this has been so awful, let's make it worse. Um, since Sheldon Keefe uh, got promoted to coach of the Leafs, the Marlies yeah. have been awful. They've been terrible. They finished 21 out of 28 this year. Uh, do you see any changes to the Leafs farm system coming this off season and the way things are done there? I have to be very upfront. I don't know. You know, I, I don't have any window into what's gone on there. It's been a weird time. I think we can acknowledge like Greg oh, yeah. Moore, the head coach that supplanted Sheldon Keefe, like gets parachuted in mid season, has a pandemic, they don't come back for like, cause they didn't come back to the bubble. Right. So they were off for, from March until February, I think almost a full year. Yeah. Then they play only 
like four teams all season. They get COVID. Like the Leafs don't really have any right, prospects right. either. Like they, they have prospects, but you know, the, the pipeline has been whittled down a little bit. You know, a they lot of guys till the end. Right. Like, I think that there's a lot of factors that, you know, but I haven't heard and I, and I really don't know if they would consider changes there. Um, you know, I, I do think that though one fallout from all this is going to be the, the recognition that they need to try to load up that pipeline one way or another. You know, I think that there's some opportunity this year with this being such a weird draft, obviously the Leafs traded a lot of their picks, but I think there'll be more free agents that could be signed that aren't drafted. You know, I think you'll, th- I think you'll see the Leafs, they got a lot of contract slots. I think they're going to be aggressive in trying to, to unearth some talent and, and the farm team will continue to be important because, you know, the cap situation is what it is. You need to graduate some players. Like is Joey Anderson going to play for the Leafs next year? Is Nick Robertson going to play for the Leafs next year? Maybe even Timothy Lilligren. Yep. Um, some of these guys at some point have to break through because they need someone making under a million dollars on, on, you know, playing meaningful minutes. So so let's let's put a bow on the on the trade deadline. The, just say bet. I would like you to bet whether these guys will be back. Okay. Uh anti Swomella. Might as well start there. <laughs> back, uh, not back. Well, I, I couldn't pick him out of a police lineup, so I'm gonna say not back. Probably not good. Stefan Nason, was he just no. a necessity to get that deal done? Yeah, it was a money thing from San Jose. I mean he played a game for the Leafs, but He's yeah. not bad. Dave Riddick. Possibly. I, 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 I don't – I think it depends how things go. I imagine that trade, though, is made with the idea, hey, we get to learn more about him, we get to see him. You know, maybe he's back. Ben – sorry, what? Uh, sorry, ben, my, my wife's putting something in the microwave. Oh, <laughs> listen, I get it. It's uh, a burrito. She's nice. eating up a burrito. Oh, nice. What kind? It's from a, a little spot on King West, downtown Toronto, called Wilbur. Wilbur. Oh, Wilbur's amazing. Love Wilbur. I love Wilbur. Do you know what the fundamental difference between my wife and I is? Is we can go there, and there's no chance I'm having any leftover. But she's disciplined enough to cut it in half, eat one half that night, oh, and eat no. the next half the next day. Like, no chance. No way. No okay, way. you need to do a background check on her. That's, yeah. that's not okay. That's the, not okay. <laughs> the trick is Sometimes, you eat it before she can get to it, so then she learns her lesson. Well, I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't do that. This is a small apartment. Oh, mm, fair enough. There'd be yeah. consequences if I ate that burrito. Uh, <laughs> Just <a> divorce. <laughs> um, abruptly getting back, Ben Hutton. Uh, maybe. The Leafs had interest in him when he went to Anaheim uh, originally, or L.A., sorry, the, the previous year. And... You know, I know we know we didn't get to see him play much, just a handful of games, but I, I could see him being a depth piece next season. Leaf killer Riley Nash. Uh, doubtful. Doubtful. And Nick Felino. Doubtful. I think he's going back to Columbus. Mm. But oh, just I have me. wondered, I have wondered, like, this didn't go well, right? And I wonder if they, they both look at it and go like, hey, maybe – there's a way forward out of this, you know, like maybe, maybe he gives it another year here because as much as he's a fixture in Columbus and it's pretty clear that there's like a retool going on there, maybe because this was so unsatisfying because he was unhealthy, maybe he signs a one-year contract to, to give it another go as a leaf. Not, not impossible. I would like that. That'd be cool. I, I would happily welcome him back. He looked fine when he was healthy. He really Chris. did. Chris, I think the, the question good. will be price, right? Like, is he willing to? Yeah. I think his previous contract was five and a half million. You know, I think it's yeah. fair to assume he's going down from that, but how far down? Does he want to help them? Does he want to be a value guy? Yeah. I mean, I'm not saying league minimum, but maybe he signs for two million instead of three million or something like that. I mean, I, I don't know what his priorities are, but the fact this didn't go well, you got to think it's at least a possibility. Chris, you, I got to ask you. What's the Bring thing? It. Give me the good news. We got to end on a positive note here. And we got three, four minutes left. So what is the good news if you're a Toronto Maple Leafs fan from CJ? Well, the sun came up on Tuesday. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Barely. Yeah. <laughs> you could see it through the, through the smoke from all the, the fires around town. Yep. <laughs> uh, um, look, there's no, there's no good spin to be put on that. 
Like they, the good news is, is the team demonstrably got better this year for four months or whatever. Like the full season, regular season, there's no doubt that this was a better version of the Maple Leafs. And I can't find any positive spin on collapsing away a three-one series under those conditions. Like this is insane. Like so, this is the one season probably in our lifetime where you're only going to play your own division. They play their own division oh. and are markedly better than every team they played all year long. They only have to beat two of those teams to get to the third round, and they lose in round one after building a three-one lead. Like you, you can't even invent those circumstances. So I'm not going to try to be lie to anyone and put a good spin on it. You just, I think the good, the good news, honestly, is that the core of this team is still young. Austin Matthews and Mitch Marner are both going to be awesome next season. Still like, like they're, they're not at the point where I'm worried about, you know, their age uh, bringing out a huge decline in their performance offensively. William Elander had a good playoffs, which is a low key positive thing that happened out of this. And I believe that the, the people that run this team are really smart people. So um, I know that that's unsatisfying. Like everyone wants blood out of this. I, I just, I think it's too soon. Let's face it. This is, they get one more year, right? Yeah. yeah. Everybody. Okay. They do but, this again. They don't make it out of the first round next year. One of the core four is gone. Yeah. And maybe okay. Kyle Dubas, maybe Anything. Sheldon keep like, like, I don't know. Well, we have to see how it happens, but like there's, there's big change. There's at least one major significant monster change if they don't get out of the first round next year. Hey, there it is. You know what? We we did get something out of this season, CJ. This t-shirt. Oh my god. Oh no. no. They wow. didn't. They didn't win it though. The, so I they're not North Division champions. No. They're they're not. I think Where did you year, get that? Some uh, company sent it to me and I don't want to say who because i want to light it on fire but i'm not going to do that it just this is i tell you what i i have another shirt that i'm not allowed i don't even i'm gonna get a screen grab of that by the way here here, if anybody wants to know it says 2021 north division champs uh toronto maple leafs uh this uh i have another forbidden shirt from a team that it's a championship shirt from a team that did not win a championship. Oh um, yeah, but what happened? Uh, they lost. <laughs> they were they were they weren't uh, they weren't supposed to uh, they weren't supposed to lose and they lost. Um, I will like like you know companies do this like when I was working with Nike, they gave me a, a bag before I went to the gold medal game, and they said if if you cannot open this bag, and if they lose the game, you throw it away. You don't open it. You never open it. The second they lose, I pull out this awesome, like, gold medal. Ah, oh, it was so good. Like, you got to make it. And somehow now I have two of these relics. They are, I guess, technically the North Division no. regular season champs. So was that cool. – was that – were those shirts going to be sold if they won the third – got through the first two rounds? I honestly don't know. I don't, as far as a, oh, I hope I'm not exposing government secrets is uh, I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> maybe we'll have to edit this out. I'm pretty sure these are available. I'm pretty sure. These oh. are okay. Now, uh, so, do they- so do you know, it's funny when I once did a story on this heading into a game seven of a cup final about how the NHL gets like both teams is because they have to have all that gear and everything they do. Like, you wouldn't believe the process. Like, they won't check any of the bags on a flight with the stuff because they're worried it could go missing or someone could steal it. Wow. And, like, they literally bring it in, like, in secret. And, like, the minute the game ends, they, like, bring out the, you know, like, if they they went so in Boston, St. Louis was a game seven, right? (laughs) Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like there's Boston Bruins win the cup in 2019 stuff, and it all gets like whisked out of the building and destroyed immediately. Wow. So sorry, these are available. They're on Real Sports Apparel, um, and just a very sad 39.99 with a line through it. They are now 27.99. For are they are they going to lift a banner for this? I they better. I not. hope not. I hope not. I the winner of Montreal Winnipeg been- can, and I think they should, because yeah. it's unique. The Leafs absolutely cannot. 
I, I would suggest to you there's no chance. Like there, that would be like adding fuel to this. Just checking. Like Bon Jovi in the Raptors. Like, did Tampa have a ceremony for the president's trophy thing, or did they just hang it? They probably just hung it. Yeah. Uh, at okay. least that's like, like a real trophy. Yeah. And that means <laughs> right? something. And it should it's mean arguably something. more important than the Stanley Cup. Arguably nerd. That's what all the stats guys keep trying to tell me. And they're liars. No yeah, one's like, yeah. hi, ah, you the president's trophy. Ah, there they are. The regular season champ. Ah. Dad, one day I'm going to win the president's trophy. Said no child ever. I hate this. It's representative of a lot of the Tuesday night wins over New Jersey, right? Like it's not, <laughs> or whatever, pick a team, but like. <sighs> No, that's you know, a good one. <laughs> you, 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 know, you, you beat Ottawa in the second half of your back-to-back with Detroit. Like, you know, I get it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, okay. You, one, you know what I was thinking? So had the Leafs got through to the third round, just like yes. in this alternate reality, yeah. I believe they would play the winner of Carolina-Tampa. Ooh, oh. Okay. Round three. So, like, looks like that could be Tampa. I don't want to get ahead of ourselves. And then – on the other side, they'd be playing the winner of Colorado slash Vegas slash Boston slash Islanders. So wow. they, they, there, there was a there was a world where they could have played Tampa and Boston at the end of the playoffs. Oh, <laughs> I'm not saying that's likely. It's just it just would have been hilarious if it worked out that way. Oh, oh, what just, could have I love been. chaos, guys. Yeah, Wiley well. Coyote, super genius, and. <laughs> Had they made it, like I would have been like, you know what? They have as good a chance as any. They they were they were deep, and I agree that Tavares injury railroads everything. And if they have Jake Muzzin and yada 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 yada. Well, and Tavares was, was probably coming back in round two. Like we can't really? know that because well, we can't know that because a concussion is unpredictable, right? It's like right. you feel good for a few days and then you don't. Like I like without a crystal ball, who knows? But I think that, that the hope was to try to get back in round two, if possible. If it, it, was wouldn't, it wouldn't be unprecedented for him to come back for a game or two because he's feeling good and then he discovers he doesn't. Mm. Right. Although I, my sense was the least we were going to be really careful with, with him. Like, I, yeah. I don't think that was lip service. Like, I, there, there was no – there was no world where they were going to try to say rush him into game seven, even though he'd resumed skating by then. Like, I think they were prioritizing the long period of time versus what could happen in these few weeks. Right. Okay. Plus, plus his life beyond hockey, which is far more yes. important. than hundred yeah. percent. Well, good. They don't have to make that decision and he doesn't have to make that decision made for him. There's a silver lining, quite yeah. honestly, that there's no pressure on him. Like, like even subtle pressure just from the situation, not that anyone's exerting on him to make, you know, like he can now heal in peace essentially. 100%. Yeah. And away from the public eye. Nobody has to ask him the question anymore. It's great. Yeah, no one's um, following his ambulance as it leaves the building. CJ, I know we'll catch up with you here in the next month or so, but uh, tough, tough episode this year to, to get through. Really tough. Uh, really appreciate your insights as always because they're so good. Um, and as much as we might not like it, you know, it's sometimes you don't choose your family. The Leafs chose their family and this is the family they're sticking with. So, Next year will be a very interesting year. This summer will be very interesting. Uh, but one thing remains the same is that you are awesome and we love you. Love you guys too. I feel like I didn't bring the heat today. It's a little harder, honestly. Some of the past off seasons, it was clear where things were going. Yeah. Probably what's interesting about this off season, I think, is that there's not an obvious direction. Like there's not, there's not one clear move that's going to happen. You know, the other anecdote that's funny, just quickly, Elliot Friedman oh. told me on Tuesday morning, like the day after game seven, he comes out with his son to his driveway and they're going to go somewhere in the morning and his neighbor's standing there like watering his lawn or something, wearing his Leafs Jersey. And, and Elliot's like, wow, that's a bold fashion pick. And he's like, I can't help it. I'm addicted to this team. Yeah. So, <laughs> I, yeah. I, I do think, I do think as much as people are angry and people have burned jerseys and whatever that, but come October 15th or whenever the first game of next season is, I think people will actually be geared up again. I know it's hard to imagine today, but uh, this was this is going to be an interesting offseason. There's going to be at least one player. Here's a prediction to leave you with. There's going to be like one player on this roster on opening night that is going to get everyone excited about like it's like I'm talking a big name or big promise player. 
and no one's going to see it coming. Like, I think that they're going to, they're going to make a big move of some sort. It's not just going to be the same group next season. You right. better, well, you better have it first, CJ. So help me, you don't have it first. <laughs> and it, the worst is, I have someone in mind, but I just, I can't release it to oh, the internet. Oh, oh, come on! Who is it? I can't. I oh, can't. can you give oh, us a hint? Are they playing games right now? No. Mm, Jack Eichel. That's it. Yeah. There <laughs> <it is. laughs> All right. You're welcome, everybody. I narrowed it down to 24 teams. 23. <laughs> Sorry. Plays on a U.S. based team. Oh, didn't play in the playoffs at all this year. Ooh, has multiple seasons remaining on his contract, and that's as far as I'm going to go. Okay, all right. Well, let's all speculate in the comments and on YouTube. Yeah. And CJ, we love you. Thank you so much for doing the show today. We appreciate it. Thanks. And maybe a month from now, I'll give you a little bit more. Okay. Ah! Can't wait. Can't wait. Can't wait. <laughs> Congrats on a great season covering the 2021 North Division champs. Yeah. The juggernaut has live on, Joe. Unreal. The Steve Dangle Podcast. Follow the guys on Twitter at Steve underscore Dangle, at Adam W-Y-L-D-E, and at Jesse Blake. Connection complete.